Thank you, worship team. Uh, I love those songs and how they focus on the majesty and the glory and greatness of God. I love that. I know he loves it as well. Um, but we're, we're considering or considering how to maintain or develop an increased passion for God. And uh, we've been looking at a snapshot of this man named Moses. And looking at a little bit of a glimpse of his life in Exodus chapter 32 and 33 and 34. And if you've got your Bible, you might want to turn there with me and follow along. But uh, last Sunday, we, we jumped in the middle of a sad, sad day for the, for the Hebrew people. And uh, you remember Moses. And I know you, you've studied this guy's life, I'm sure. But just to be reminded that Moses was God's chosen instrument to deliver the Hebrew people from the bondage of Egypt. And uh, with, with God's might, he, he revealed his power, didn't he? He revealed his, his glory uh, through the ten plagues in Egypt. Remember that? These, these, these wonders that he performed. And, and what was he showing there? Well, he was showing that there is no God like him. There is no God in Egypt like him. That he is the one true living God. And he displayed that through these, these, ten, these ten wonders. And, and so God begins his eternal plan of revealing something of his glory to all the nations of the world through a people, a chosen people, the Hebrew people. And folks, think of it that this day in the new covenant, God is in the business of revealing his glory to the world through you, the people of God, the church. Well, it's amazing how he does that, right? Because, you know, we see here that the, the people that he's using and displaying his glory, they're kind of a rough group of people. In fact, he says they're a stiff-necked, rebellious people who are constantly complaining to God, griping, whining to God. And, and all God's asking, really, is that they would trust him. And obey him. And if they would do that, he would provide for them. He would provide food and shelter and water and clothing. And he, he would take them into this, this land that they would possess. A beautiful land flowing with milk and honey. What a, what a place that would be. In chapter 33, or 32, Moses is on Sinai, right? And He's on that mountain. He receives the law of God. And, and he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. That's a long time, right? And the people are left down there. And, and they, they, they grew impatient, didn't they? And, and, and they begin to demand Aaron to make them or bring them a, make them a god, like the gods of the nations. It's interesting. They said, make us gods, plural. Well... They make a god, and it's a golden calf, and uh, that's not a good move, is it? Aaron, he, he kind of caves, does not kind, he does. Uh, he wimps out. And, and so God's informing Moses on the mountain that, that, that the people are in rebellion. And, and that as he goes back to the camp, there's going to be this golden calf there that they're actually... They're actually worshiping. And so God's with Moses. Moses is with God. Joshua's down below a little farther. But, but God's angry. God's, it says that his anger burns. And not only is God angry, but, but Moses is angry as well. And you remember how angry God is? God's angry at sin, folks. He always is angry at sin. Because sin destroys, sin brings death, sin separates. And, and so God is so angry that he's telling Moses, Moses, I, I'm going to wipe them out. 
I'm starting over with you. And folks, Moses shines here, doesn't he? I mean, he really does. Moses, he doesn't even seem to entertain the prospect of becoming the new uh, Mosaic covenant that God would, you know, bring about a redemption, his redemption plan. And so Moses, we find him pleading with God on behalf of, of honoring God's name. That, folks, that is what was important in Moses. He wanted to honor the name of God, right? He didn't want God's name to be, to be tarnished. And, and he says in verses 10 through 13, basically he says, he says, God, what would the nation say if, if, if they saw that you were unable to do what you said you were going to do? They, God, they would discredit your name. And God, that can't be. We can't have that, God. And so you find Moses, he's pleading with God. He's saying, God, no, don't wipe your people out. God, then they would display that you're unable. You're unable to do what you said you would do. And folks, we know that throughout the Bible, we see that when God says he's going to do something, he does it. He does it. And so verse 14, an amazing verse, God relents. God relents. And it looks as though God changed his mind. And I suggested last Sunday that he didn't. God doesn't change his mind. But God was doing something here. And I think, let me ask you this. Could it be that, that God kept Moses on Sinai long enough so that the people would become rebellious and impatient and commit idolatry so that God might desire to exterminate all of them so that Moses might intercede as a type of Christ on behalf of the people that God would display then his mercy to a people who deserved to be wiped out. And by the way, we all deserve to be wiped out. We've all fallen short of the glory of God because we've all sinned. Haven't we? But God wants to display something. You know, as I look through the word of God and read through Genesis through Revelation, I see something about God. God has a desire to show us something of his character. And that's a beautiful thing because he doesn't have to. God doesn't need anything. God is all sufficient within himself. He doesn't need to show anybody anything about himself because God is. But he desires to teach us, to show us something about his character. And we're going to see here, as we get a little deeper into this text, that, that God desires to show something of his, of his grace and his, and his mercy to a people who don't deserve that. A people that don't deserve it. But there still is consequence for sin, right? And, and, and so God's angry. Moses is angry. His, in fact, the text says that his, his anger grew hot. He's really, he's really ticked off here. And he comes down off the mountain, right? And he takes those, those tablets of stone, which is the law of God, the Mosaic law, and he throws them down and he cry, breaks them up. And I got to thinking about that. Was that wrong of Moses to do? Man, he's angry here. Is it wrong to be angry? Not necessarily. It, the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. It's okay to be angry about sin. Moses is angry about, about the sin of the people and discrediting the name of God. And, and, and he's, he's, he crashes, he breaks up those, those tablets of stone, which I think could be a picture you know, there's a lot of types in Scripture. But I think it could be a picture of how all of us, all of humanity, have shattered the law of God. We broke it. 
And Moses is displaying that man. He throws those tablets of stone down and they, they crumble. The law breaks up. And God is showing us that, you know what? We've all broken the law of God. God's law, you know, God's law gets a bad rap today. You know, you've heard people sometimes say, oh, the law, God's law. You know, the law, you know, we don't like law. We like grace. But Paul says, no, it, the law is righteous and holy and good. I mean, you think about the law of God. The law of God shows us how we're to live. People say, well, we're not under law today. We're under grace. True, but we still, we still live by that law. We still have a desire to obey God's law, right? We can't keep it perfectly. It's not a way to righteousness, which the Pharisees thought was. But God's law is good. It's us that aren't good. We're the ones that have shattered his law. And I think this, is a, this could be a pretty clear picture of that. Well, you know, Moses comes down and he, he destroys the golden calf. I, I get a kick out of this. It's, well, probably shouldn't get a kick out of it, but it, it's kind of comical. A little bit. He takes that, that calf and he grinds it up, the powder, and he... he, he Scatters it on the water, and he says, now drink it. <laughs> Ooh, that must have not... But he's, you know, he's, these people are seeing that, hey, don't, we don't mess with God. We don't, we don't rebel against this great God. And so they end up drinking that which they had made and worshipped. And so Moses, he confronts Aaron. And, and remember Aaron, he kind of plays the blame game. You know, in chapter 32, verses 21 through 24, you know, it's kind of like, well, God, Moses, you know these people, right? I mean, they're always bent on evil. I mean, for crying out loud, you know, I, 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 they wanted this calf, and so I said, okay, uh, bring me all your gold, and we threw all the gold in the fire, and poof, out popped this calf. <laughs> I mean, what is the guy, nuts? I think so, a little bit. That's what sin does, right? We talked a little bit about that last Sunday. We don't think right. And, and uh, you know, I would have loved to have seen the look on Moses' face as Aaron's telling him this story. Well, so Moses orders the sons of Levi. Well, first of all, he, he draws the line in the sand, remember? And in verse 25, he says, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And then he instructs the sons of Levi to take up their swords and go out throughout the, throughout the people and 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 destroy those who were disobedient. And it says that 3,000 died. Quite a few people. Hey, just a little footnote here. I thought it was kind of interesting that, you know, at the giving of the law here in this text, 3,000 died. But at the, when the gospel was first preached in Acts, 3,000 were saved. Interesting. Interesting. Only the gospel can save, folks. The law kills. Why? Because it shows us our sin. Right? That's what Paul says in Romans 7. It reveals to us that we, that we, are, we are sinners. It's like that tutor that, that shows us. It teaches us. But the gospel? Oh, don't you love the gospel? Gospel gives life. Jesus gives, gives life. Do you have that life this morning? Do you really? I, I hope you do. Man, I hope you do. I pray that you do. But Moses goes back to meet with God and he pleads with God to forgive the people this great sin, right? And, and he even asks God... Uh, to take his life along with theirs. If he's going to destroy me, he says, God, take me too. Take my name out of the book of life, which is <laughs> absolutely amazing. Don't think I could do that. I don't think you could either. But Moses says that he, he's so identified with the people. He says, God, you can't. He's so concerned about God's name. He says, God, if you're going to wipe them out, wipe me out. You know, and God's drawing this out of Moses, isn't he? He's drawing these things out of him. And, and you come to chapter 33, 
And we find some devastating news here. Let me just read a few verses. In chapter 33, verse 1, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Depart. Go up from here, you and the people whom you have, whom you have brought up out of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, and to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you. And I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Pez Perizzites. I call them Perizzites, but you shouldn't do that. Close. The Hivites and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way. For you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. And no one put on his ornaments. For Moses, for the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people, you are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. And therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb and onward. And so... Here this chapter begins by, by God commanding Moses to go and lead the people into the promised land and, and the land that, that he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But God iterates what he said in, in, verse, in verse 34 of chapter 32. He says, but go lead the people to the place which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel will go before you nevertheless. In the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. So God is really re reiterating in chapter 33 what he's already said in chapter 32. Moses, I'm not coming with you. I'm not coming. I'll send my angel. I don't know what you think about angels, but angels are powerful, as I see in the Word of God. Kind of like them. I mean, the good angels. And if I would have been Moses, I'd have said, okay, yeah, that's okay. That's, that's, that's pretty good. An angel? Pfft, powerful. Look what one angel did to the armies of Moab in the Old Testament. Powerful. But it wasn't good enough for Moses. And folks, it wasn't good enough for the people. It says, when, it says here that when the people, verse 4, when they heard this disastrous word, this news that, that God would not go before him, man, they were they were. Upset. There was, a, there was an outward expression of their genuine repentance. They took off their ornaments. That's a picture of their repentance, their remorse. And folks, we've got to remember that, you know, when you, when you talk about confessing sin, you can't take the word repentance out of it. People don't like that word today. Repentance, that's a negative word. No, it's not. It's a good thing to turn from sin and to turn to Christ. It's a good thing. And so when we sin, when we blow it, we need to be like these people here in the sense that they, they had an outward expression of their repentance. It starts inward. There's a remorse. There's a conviction of sin. And we go, God, I have blown it. God, I agree with you that this is sin. And I'm turning from it. I'm turning back to you. God, help me to do that. And God is so delighted when, when we obey him in that way. Well, then we see some amazing <laughs> requests to God from Moses. And, and it's, it's amazing. Well, first of all, you, you see in verse 7 that, uh, that, that Moses would meet with God in this, in this tent outside the camp. In fact, let me read it. It says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it, out, pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at the door of his tent and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. 
And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. And God would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his own tent. And thus the Lord, watch this now, verse 11, it says, And thus the Lord used to speak with Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. And when Moses turned again to the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. So get this picture. Here's this tent of meeting. It's kind, it was kind of like a portable tent. As the people would travel, they would set this tent up outside the camp. And you know, why outside the camp? I think it has to do with God's holiness. That God is so holy that he can't, he can't enter into a sin group of people. And, and so there would be this tent of meeting outside the camp. And when people wanted to worship him, they would kind of follow Moses outside. And they would stand from a distance, but they would watch Moses as he would go inside this tent. Is that awesome or what? I mean, think about that. And the people would watch this. Do you think, what do you think their attitude was when they would see this cloud, this kind of glory come down and descend on this tent? And, and they were so awed that they would, right, that they would just worship. They would, they would worship God. What we were doing this morning as we sing songs. We worship Him. And so they would see this and, and Moses would go in and and it says he would interact with God. He would speak with God face to face as one speaks to a friend. Folks, do you know that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, if, if you've trusted him as your Lord and Savior, you have been transferred from an enemy of God to a friend of God. Isn't that beautiful? To call God my friend. Jesus said that once to his disciples, didn't he? He says, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. Isn't it an awesome thing to be a friend of God? But that's one of the, one of the benefits. The Ephesians chapter 1 talks about, you know, that we've received all these blessings. And I think the, the greatest blessing of all is that we have been changed from foe to friend to God. And it can only happen in, it can only happen in Christ. And then it says that Joshua's there. I, I get a kick out of this. This is a whole study in and of itself. Joshua's there. And I think Joshua was Moses' apprentice. And Joshua, was, he's, he's right there, man. He's right at the entrance of the tent. And he's watching this man. And Moses, you know, he's done meeting with God and he leaves. What does Joshua do? Joshua stays. I read a lot of commentaries on that. And most of them, you know, they're a little bit different. But I think the one I like is, you know, the question was, why did Joshua stay there? And most of them would say, because he didn't want to miss out on anything. He was so hungry for God. I think what Joshua saw in Moses, he saw this passion for God. And Joshua probably came to that place in his life where he said, I want to be like that guy. I want to have that kind of passion for God. And the only way I'm going to have that passion kindled in my life is to experience and see the glory of God. I like Joshua. I like the book of Joshua, the, the book of conquest. It's a great book. But Joshua's being prepared, isn't he? Moses was near to God. But notice, folks, the people were distant. You notice that? The people were distant. Moses is near, but the people are distant. Have you ever felt like God isn't really close? Ever felt like that? God, where are you at? You know, I felt like that sometimes. 
And, and I think the enemy has a heyday with that. Oh, God's not really there. He's, he doesn't really love you. You know, he kind of interjects these thoughts into our, our minds when we go through trials. Remember we said last Sunday that, that trials will, ever, will either cause you to run to Christ or they'll cause you to run away from Christ. But when we have trials like that, you know, we need to run to Christ because James tells us, remember James, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And, and, and I think I, I wrestled with that at the time in my life because I, I recognize in the new covenant that, that there's, a, there's, a, um, there's an assurance of finality in the sense that when Jesus comes into your life, he comes to reside there. He comes to, he comes to stay. And the writer of Hebrews would tell us that, that he, God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. But so what is that when you feel like he's left? I think it's this. I think when we choose to go our own way, and it happens so subtly, we just kind of slowly drift off into the river and we get caught in that current and we slowly go down that current of sin, sometimes without even knowing it. So we lose this. Not that God's not there, because he is, because he promised he would be. But we lose this sense of intimacy with him. What needs to happen? What needs to happen is the same thing. We go back to the Hebrew people. We need to repent and we need to get right with God again. You know, when I feel like that, and it's not always that, but sometimes it is, where I kind of do my own thing or have my own way. And, and, and I'm going, God, where are you at? And so the Spirit begins to convict me and show me things in my life that aren't right, that I need to get right with Him. And once I get right with Him, then that intimacy comes back. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. That intimacy. Don't you long for that? So the people are in a distance. Moses is close. Again, I think it's a picture of the new covenant. That apart from Christ, we're distant from God. But when we come to Christ, we are brought close to him again through the blood of Jesus. Well, Moses makes a few requests here that absolutely blow me away. And the first one is in, look at verse 12 here in chapter 33. Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I, I know you by name, and you have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may, may, may know you in order to find favor in your sight. And God, by the way, Consider, too, that this nation is your people. <laughs> wow. See what Moses is asking for here in his first request? He says, God, God, here's the deal. God, I want to know you. I want to know your ways, God. And I think about that and I go, wait a minute, Moses. You know him. <laughs> right? I mean... I mean, if anybody knew God in the Old Testament, it was Moses. I mean, he met with God. He encountered God at the burning bush. God gave him his mission, kind of wimped out, and so it went to Aaron as being the spokesperson. And, and yet God, Moses walked with God, and God used him in Egypt to, to deliver the people. Moses knew God. So what's he saying here? I think he's saying the same thing Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. Where Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I think that they wanted to know more of God. 
They wanted it to know him better, which tells me that, folks, we're on a journey here in this life. We don't just arrive. We do arrive in the sense we receive salvation once and for all the moment we place faith in Jesus Christ. Bang, it's there. It's forever. But this journey of growth, remember we talked about that one verse, from glory to glory? We are growing in Christ. And as we grow in Christ, we get to know him better. Danger, we become satisfied. We become satisfied. We don't need to read our Bibles anymore. We already know. You already know God, right? Well, look how God answers in verse 14. And he said, Moses, hey, listen, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. You know, folks, it's like Moses is saying here, God, show me your ways, show me your ways. And, and it's like God knows that Moses is not satisfied. And God knows Moses is not satisfied with an angel. I mean, angels are pretty cool, but not good enough for Moses. Moses is saying, God, if you don't go with me, I ain't going. Isn't it good to know, folks, that here in this life, in the New Testament era, that where you go, he goes? Where he goes, he doesn't leave you. When he gives you a mission, when he give, calls you to do something, he goes before you. He goes with you. He's right there. What a promise. And that's what Moses is after here. Look at the second request in verse 15 and 16. And he asked him, God, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. There it is. Verse 16, for, you, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, God? I and your people. Is it not in your going with us that we are distinct I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. And so Moses is making this request again, saying, God, if I found favor in your, in, in your sight, you have to be in our midst here. You have to go. He's kind of reiterating these things. It's like, Moses, aren't you getting this? <laughs> he keeps on asking for the same thing, right? Why? Does he not believe God? I think he believes God, but he wants, he wants so much assurance. He wants to hear it from the word of God over and over again. You know, folks, that's what we need to do sometimes when we lack assurance in a particular area in our lives. We need to hear from God over and over again. We need to saturate our minds with the truth of what God says. That's what Moses wanted. That's what Moses wanted. And look what God says in verse 17. And the Lord says to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. I love that. It's like, you know, you'd think that God would say, come on, Moses, get with it. Don't you get it, Moses? You're not getting it. He doesn't do that. He's delighted to reiterate and to let Moses know, Moses, I'm coming with you, man. Moses, you have found favor in my sight. Are you getting it now, Moses? And he's just, he wants more. And then his third request, I just go, come on. I mean, if I was Moses, uh, the first two would have been fine with me. But not with him. Look what he says. Look at this. Verse 18. And Moses said, are you with me now? Please show me your glory. Please show me your glory. Now, why was Moses asking for that? He'd been in the tent of meeting several times. He'd seen the Shekinah glory. He'd seen the the cloud by day and the fire by night. He, he'd seen the, 
the Red Sea just separate. He'd seen the ten plagues and he saw the glory of God. But folks, again, again, he is not satisfied. He wants more. And you would think God would say, Moses, pfft, no way. You're, you're asking, you've had enough of my glory. You've had enough. <laughs> but God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. Let's just finish this real quick here. Well, not quick. Maybe. And he said to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on a rock. And while my glory passes, I will put you in a cleft on the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I pass by. And then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back. But my face, my face you shall not see. God is delighted to answer Moses' prayer here. To a point, right? Folks, I believe Moses knew something of God's glory, but, but was God's glory such a, a nature that would cause Moses to believe that God would really be gracious to his people? What would the qualifier of God's, of God's presence to succeed them and go before them, what would be the qualifier that God would do this? Would it be in the people? That they were something, there was something good about them that, that would cause God to, to do this and to have this mercy and show this grace? No, folks, it wasn't in the people. It was in God. It was in His nature. It was in his character. That was the qualifier that God would answer this prayer and go before the people. And Moses, Moses wanted to see that in its fullness. He wanted to see and experience the, this, this glory of his mercy and his grace. Folks, the, the core of God's being is what he has just said here. Folks, that's good to know. And Moses needed to know that because he has seen a side of God that's pretty frightening. He's seen the, the anger and the wrath of God upon the people of disobedience. He'd seen the wrath of God on the Egyptian people that, 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 that wouldn't let the people go, but eventually did. He'd seen the, this, this side of God, but now he's longing to see this mercy and this grace of God. And God is saying, Moses, this is who I am. This is who I am. <laughs> Moses asks for glory, to see the glory. What does God do? He gives him his name. He gives him his name. And he says, Moses, you can't see the fullness, though. You can't see my face. You see a little discrepancy here in Scripture? Tell me you do. I see you going like this. This it does kind of pose a problem, this little, this little portion, because, because, you know, in chapter 33, verse 11, Moses is speaking to God face to face as one speaks with a friend. And here in chapter 33, verse 20, we're saying that God's saying, no, Moses, you can't even see my face and live. So what's going on? Discrepancy? No. Not at all. This is what we call one of those theophanies of the Old Testament. A manifestation of God that is tangible to the human senses, in, often in human form, right? But not always. There was the burning bush, was, which was a theophany. It, it was just, whenever you see a, theo, see a, a, a theophany of, of God in human form, I believe, and many believe this too, that it's a pre-incarnate vision of Christ in the Old Testament. 
And so I think in the tent of meeting, when Moses is speaking to God face to face, he's experiencing this. God is veiling his glory in human form like Jesus did when he came to earth. And so Moses can interact with God. But here in this text, in verse 20, he's, he's, God's pulling all that back and he's saying, Moses, you can't see the fullness of my glory and live. Isn't that awesome? I, I think it's pretty awesome. I'll tell you something that's even more awesome. Psalm 11:7 says, righteous men will see his face. The same thing in Job chapter 33, verse 26. Job speaks of those who will see the face of God. Here's what I believe that's saying, folks. No one can see the face of God unless they are clothed in the righteousness of of Jesus Christ. And that's why I believe that when we get to heaven, whenever that's going to be, we are going to be so in Christ, we're going to get it a little bit more than we get down here. We are going to be so clothed with His perfect righteousness and holiness that we will be able to look into the face of God and not be incinerated. That's what the Bible says. Righteous people will see his face. Not your righteousness, not mine, but his. He veils us, he clothes us, he protects us in his perfect, perfect righteousness. This is an awesome request, folks, Moses said. Charles Spurgeon, let me quote something. For, I think he got it right here. He says, he says, and I quote, he said, It is the greatest peti petition man ever asked of God. It seems to me the greatest stretch of faith that I have ever heard or read of. It is the greatest request man could make to God. I beseech thee, show me that glory. He had, if he had requested a fiery chariot to whirl him to heaven, had he asked to, to cleave the water floods and drown the... the chivalry of, of a nation? Had he prayed the Almighty to send fire from heaven to consume whole armies? I could have found a parallel to this prayer, but when he offers this petition, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. He stands alone, a giant among giants, a colossus even in those days of mighty men, end of quote. Spurgeon had some good insight. God, show me your glory. I want to I see the fullness of it, God. No, Moses can't. Not yet. And, and Moses, you know, I, I don't know. What, what do you think God looked like when he walked by? <laughs> and he saw the backside of God. Was it just this radiance of light? I don't know. Scripture doesn't say for sure. We know the transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured, you know. He, he, there, was a, there was, a, I think, a, just a, a glimpse of his glory that Peter, James, and John got, and it was awesome. I think when they came to arrest him in, in the garden, and, and, and they said, well, who is this Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, I am he. Something happened there that caused them all to fall to the ground, a whole group of soldiers. I think, probably, God just said, let me just give you a little glimpse of my glory. And poof, without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it's over. You can't take it. Folks, what enabled Moses to, to possess such a, such a high degree of boldness? Well, I mean, what happened? What happened to this insecure, timid man that God called way back in Exodus chapter 3 to speak to the Hebrew people? And Moses, remember, he trembled before God. He says, God, I can't do this. And here, ooh, here's a changed man. What caused him to do that? You know what it was, folks? It was God's grace and mercy on Moses. Tearing in the presence of God at the burning bush, standing on holy ground, that was grace. 
That was mercy. That was God. Being used of God as his instrument to bring down the ten wonders in, in the land of Egypt. What was that? It was God's unconditional, sovereign, free grace given to Moses. God's power, remember, in, in departing the, the Red Sea and des destroying the Egyptian army. What was that? That was God's grace given to Moses. And so God is experiencing this grace after grace after grace after grace. And now here he is. He's prepared to meet with God in this way. Folks, you know that God is preparing you for something? He is, you know. God, you know, if you're a Christian here, you never stand still. Somebody said you're either digressing or you're progressing. But let me say this. When you get a glimpse of the glory of God, you get hungry and you get thirsty for him. And you know what else you do? You cause other people to get hungry and thirsty for him. Are you getting anybody thirsty for Jesus? As they look at your life, they see something of the character of God. What is that, folks? That's, that's glory. That's the beauty of God living out his, his character in you. That love, that joy, that peace, that patience, that kindness, that goodness. You know, I, I was thinking about this this week. You know, the, the analogy that Paul gives us of the church. We are the bride of Christ, right? And you know, whenever you go to a wedding, let's be honest, you're usually not looking too much at the groom. You're looking at that. I mean, here, you know, here's the groom. He's standing up there with his guys, you know, and, and all of a sudden the music starts and the doors open and here comes the bride and she walks down the aisle and all the eyes go on her. And they notice that beautiful white dress and that beautiful hairdo or whatever, you know, and they're, they're looking at the beauty of the bride. And I got to thinking, that's us. We're the bride of Christ. And, and so the world should be looking at us and seeing the beauty and the glory of God in and through us. Folks, let's be honest. Sometimes they don't see that, do they? Sometimes they're so busy fighting with one another and bad-mouthing one another and talking against one another that they see just the opposite and they come to a conclusion and they say, man, I don't want to be a part of that. I get enough of that kind of stuff at work. And no, folks, you know what we should be saying? Honestly, you know what we should be saying? Shame on us. And I'm doing this. I'm not pointing fingers here. I, I think of... You know, what does my tongue say about my brother and sisters in Christ all the time? Am I saying things that is constructive or am I saying things that is destructive? Imagine what it would be like <laughs> if we were just always constantly concerned about building each other up in Christ. Think of what the world would see, folks. They would see they would see what they saw in Acts chapter 2. They would see something supernatural taking place in common, ordinary people. Let's commit to that this year. Let's commit to building each other up. Let's not tear our brothers and sisters down. And if you've got something against a brother, you know what you should do. Don't say a word about until you go to the source and you sit down with them and, and you interact with them to make things right. The glory of God. Hmm. I want to close with this because I, I know you know this and I, we just need to be reminded of it. That God's glory is something that is so beyond us. But you know, folks, you know when the fullness of his glory, you know when it was displayed to the world? It was at the cross of Jesus Christ. 
is when God displayed not only his holiness, because he did at the cross, his righteousness, his justice, but God also displayed his love and his mercy and his grace. The apex of God's glory is Calvary. Folks, it's there where we receive the gift of salvation when we look upon this one who became sin for us, who was punished for us so that I could live eternally with him. And folks, we have heard that so many times before that sometimes we fall in the trap of growing tired of hearing it. May it never be so. God's mercy, God's grace is seen at the cross of Jesus Christ and it was, it was validated by the fact when they put him in that tomb, they thought that hey, they had done away with this Jesus stuff. But on the third day, he he came back to life. And not only did he show the world, but he showed all the principalities and powers that this is my glory and this is how I am victorious. The death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And right now, folks, he's interceding for you and me. He's praying for us. He's longing that we would have intimacy with him. Let's do that. Let's pray together. Father, God, we are, Lord, I, we are so unworthy to receive your grace and your mercy. But Lord, we thank you that you have made us worthy. That you, God, have loved us before the foundations of the world. God, we don't fully understand that, God. At the cross, not only do we see your majesty, but we see some of the mystery of God as well. Lord, you are an amazing God. And we want to thank you, Father, for delighting in revealing something of your glory to us. And Lord, may we as a people of yours here at Good News Fellowship, may we be a people who hunger and thirst to receive more and more of an understanding of your glory, not only in understanding, but that we would experience your glory every day, God. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for his death and burial and resurrection. Thank you, Father, for the victory we have in him and only him. God, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.